Hello and welcome to Pickleball Therapy, the podcast dedicated to your pickleball improvement. Hope you're doing well this week and are enjoying yourself wherever you are in the world. Maybe playing some pickleball and adding to your game if that's what you want to do with your game. We are in Lake Tahoe this week. Uh, going to have some camps next week. Pretty excited about that. We got five days back-to-back camps. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're hitting all the pillars. We're going to be... Uh, you know, just exploring every part of the game and, and helping uh, players uh, get as good as they want to be. Uh, our new thing is be the best pickleball player you can and want to be. That's really important. So uh, you got to play the game that's right for you. In this week's podcast, we're going to be talking about a couple of different things. We're going to be talking about pickleball as a game of opportunities and opportunity taking. And if you don't take the opportunities and your opponents do, then what happens? And in the rift, Talk a little about rally scoring, this new thing that everybody's talking about as coming into the game. Stay tuned for the podcast. Paddle from a company that you may have never heard of called Diadem Sports. Diadem is new to pickleball, but not to racket sports. It's a long-standing company located in South Florida, and they spent the last two years designing this paddle, and it shows. The Icon offers the best playability, by which I mean combination of power, control, weight, and feel, of any paddle that Jill and I have played with or tested, and we've tested a bunch. If you're looking for a paddle with unsurpassed playability, check out the Icon Paddle at diadempickleball.com. I'll link to that below in the show notes. You can use code VIPICKLE10 at the site for 10% off the paddle. If you want to read more about the Icon Paddle, I'll also link down below to our full paddle review in the show notes. If you try out the paddle, send me an email and let us know how the paddle impacted your game. Good luck out there. We generally think of pickleball as being an error avoidance game or a game where our main objective is to avoid or minimize the number of unforced errors that we have during a game. And that is generally correct. The team with the least unforced errors during a game, assuming everything else is the same, is more likely than not to win that game. And that's that's something that you should strive for in your game. Don't strive for zero errors because that's unattainable. Even the greatest players in any sport commit unforced errors and it's just part of human nature when we do anything, including playing pickleball. But what you do want to do is reduce the number of unforced errors you have. What I want to talk about here though is I want to talk about the other side of the coin, which is not capitalizing on opportunities that present themselves when you're playing pickleball. So think about it this way. Say you have two teams that are equally matched in every aspect, including number of unforced errors. So each team is identical in unforced errors. But one of the teams takes advantage of opportunities when they arise, and the other team does not or plays more passively or more defensively than the first team. If if I was to ask you which team you expect to win that game, I would hope that you would say the team that capitalizes on the opportunities is more likely to win the game than the team that played passively or plays passively and does not take advantage of opportunities when they arise. So what I want to explore in this podcast is the concept of taking advantage of opportunities and of, of capitalizing on those opportunities when they present themselves and what the consequences of not doing so look like when you're out playing pickleball. Let me give you a specific example, and this is something that arose recently. I, I joined uh, some of our, our local players and friends uh, that were playing some open play here in Tampa, and I hadn't been out to that open play in a while, so I went out this last uh, week, and we played uh, played some games. And one of the things that I noticed, one of the, the aspects that I noticed that could be improved on the courts was taking advantage of opportunities when they present it, and in particular, one in particular, which is the attackable neutral dink. And what I'm talking about here is actually it's an extreme version of this, which is a a dink hit by the opponents that is high, right? Not not deep because you can't you can't smash it. It's high near the net, and and then basically bounces and sits up above the net again. So basically it bounces and then comes up above the net after the bounce. So now you have a clearance. Say you have, you know four or five inches, three, four or five inches above the net that you can attack that ball. And I, what I noticed was a lot of players were, were going up to that ball and then just basically dinking it back across, very similar to the dink that had come over. And what I was suggesting to players who I knew that I, that I thought could, you know, that I thought could uh, benefit from this was, as we were playing, was maybe consider attacking that ball. By attacking that ball, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go up there and slam it, right? You don't have to go up there and hit somebody in the head with the ball. But you, there's other things that you can do with a dink that sets up like that, that's really short and high. One is you can attack, you can 
you know, start an attack. That's a possibility. There is a risk there because you're inside the non-volley zone. So if you if you go hard at somebody from there and aren't able to reestablish behind the non-volley zone, you commit a fault. But there are some other things you can do. Uh, for instance, you can attack cross court, which in which then sets your opponent up for the kill shot if you get a pop up. You can also do we call them aggro dinks. I think it's a pretty good term. I know uh, Tyson McGuffin. Uh, calls them um, uh, push dinks or basically a, kind of like attack dinks, but push dinks. And, you know, basically the, the mechanics are the same. We It's still a push, whether you call them aggro dink or push dink, but it's a it's an aggro dink where basically you go up there and you, you're aggressive with your next shot. And what you're looking for is you're, you're basically looking to stress your opponents. So what you're looking to do is you're looking to take that short, high dink, step up to the dink because, you know, it's inside the NPC, so you're going to step into it. And then you're going to basically push that ball into a corner or between your opponents, kind of push it back between them a little bit. The idea is to create a situation where you can, um, again, stress your opponents and then either get an error by your opponents or get a clean pop-up that you can then uh, put down. But what you what what I'd suggest you don't do with a uh, neutral attackable dink like that is step into the non-volley zone and then simply lift that ball um, you know, over the net again to another neutral dink. Because what happens then is, say you're playing against me, right? And and you get this dink from me. You get you put me in a bad spot. I lift it. I give you something that you can keep on putting pressure with me on. But you choose not to. And you come out of it and you basically send it back over neutral. I assure you that the next ball you're going to get from me is not going to be a neutral dink. I'm going to try and stress you as best I can. I'm going to either move you with a, with a deep dink, you know, at, at or near the non-volley zone line or behind it, if I can get the angle right. Or I'm going to flick it into somebody's body. I may lob it. I'm probably not going to lob it from there because that, that one's too good for the other shots. But basically, I'm going to try and do something aggressive and, and, and offensive with that shot to try and, and take advantage of the opportunity. Um, because my the way that I approach the game is, I, you know, again, opportunity. You have to take advantage of opportunities. And what ends up happening is if you have a situation where you're not taking advantage of the opportunities, but your opponents are, that's going to put you in a tough spot to try and win the game. And so you want to balance your error avoidance, but you also want to make sure you're taking advantage of opportunities when they present themselves. Our 2021 VI Pickleball camps held by CJ Johnson and myself in Lake Tahoe, Nevada this September are currently sold out. You can get on the waiting list for those, but we will be holding our 2022 camps in January in lovely Tampa, Florida. It'll be a great time of year to come to Tampa. If you're interested in receiving information about the camps, send us an email at camps at wearepickleball.com. Again, camps with a plural at wearepickleball.com, and we'll make sure you get that information. Perhaps another way to think about taking advantage of opportunities is not to become too passive when you're playing, not to become too defensive and passive. If you think about it, if you play purely defensively, um, again, assuming the other team is is the same level as you, in terms of their ability not to make errors, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to end up playing just a purely defensive game. And what ends up happening there is you're just basically uh, receiving attack upon attack upon attack upon stress and hoping that you can properly reset each ball without giving a, a clean pop-up put-away kind of a shot. What you want to do is rather than, than playing purely defensively is you want to play defensively when appropriate but then switch gears to offense or aggression when appropriate. And the kind of situation that I that I referred to, that neutral high dink that sits up and is just is sitting on a tee basically waiting for you to go up and do something with it, is a, is a perfect opportunity to start developing those instincts, developing those those abilities. And what you want to do is when you're playing, if you if you get one of those high, really neutral dinks that sets up and you go in there and just dink it over, maybe pause after the end of the rally and say to yourself, well, maybe could I have done more with that shot there? And if the answer is no, the answer is no. But I'm going to I'm gonna uh, suggest to you that there are many, many times that you're getting those type of situations that maybe you're not recognizing, and recognizing those will definitely help you uh, improve. And the other thing I wanted to mention on this is that as you, as you, as you advance in the game, so as, you, as your levels improve, as your skill set improves with your shots, what you'll notice is your margins actually increase for attack. Uh, you know, now the your pop-up zone that you're used to smashing instead of being at your shoulder now drops to like your, let's say your third rib, and then maybe it drops, you know, to your bottom rib. And then, it, you know, so if you look at like a, you know, a Ben Johns or a player like that, they're attacking balls that are underneath the net. Uh, in fact, I came across a video recently where 
you know, Riley Newman was showing you how to attack balls under the net, right? And that's possible, right? You can do that as long as you have this, the, the tools to do it. Uh, I'm not suggesting you run out there and start attacking balls that are underneath the net. That's a difficult shot. All I'm suggesting to you right now is that start looking for your opportunity zones, if you will, to, to expand as you improve as a pickleball player and make sure you take advantage of those opportunities. In the riff, we're going to talk about rally scoring and how it might impact our game. Stay tuned for the riff. You'd like to help your friend or family member learn how to play pickleball, but how? Now it's easy. Pick up a copy of Play Pickleball, A Beginner's Guide. It's the most complete guide to playing pickleball. Available as a digital download or in hard copy at intopickle.com or at Amazon. Let's keep growing the sport. Not many topics get pickleball players more riled up than rally scoring. Start talking about rally scoring and you will get into all sorts of debates with pickleball players about the game and its history and things like that. And I don't uh, begrudge any of those convers- any of those players for having that conversation. In fact, I've had that conversation. Uh, I am a big fan of the way that we currently have our scoring systems in pickleball. Um, it's a beautiful system that allows you to uh, you know, really mount comebacks, you know, think of those, those matches where you've been down, you know, nine, three, nine, two, even, you know, if you're down 10, zero or whatever, you know, with our current scoring, um, um, system or scoring rules, you have a chance to come back, right? You have a, a, a realistic or not realistic, but you have a, you have a, some chance to come back, right? I mean, it's still a, still a, a, tr- a real, uh, climb to get up there, but you know, you do have a chance to come back because you just side out, score a couple of points, side out, score a couple of points, side out, you know, keep going and keep building. And then you got this nice comeback. Rally scoring will likely mean that those comebacks will almost be, um, you know, if they, if they were 5% before, you know, when you're down 10, zero or, you know, nine, two or something like that, if, if those were like five or 10% chances with rally scoring, you're probably going to be down to like, you know, a 1% chance to see that kind of comeback. The reason is because you know it is it very difficult to go on a single run that that that's that many points, you know, because if you're down let's say like nine three right, under rally scoring, uh, if you're playing to eleven still, uh, the, the the games may be longer, but it's same same premise will apply if even if you're nineteen thirteen, but nine three, if you're going to eleven on a rally scoring, you would have to score eight points on your serve without being sighted out. Because if you scored three points and got sided out, the side out is two serves and they're going to get to 11 and that's the end of the game. So you're not going to see those big comebacks. That's not going to be possible anymore. The underlying strategy, though, of how we play the game um, still will remain that the return side will have the advantage because of the two bounce rule. Unless they change that, that'll really you know, blow things up. But I don't think they will. So the two bounce rule basically will still give the return team the advantage when you're playing. And the uh, serve team will have the uphill battle. The key in rally scoring will become uh, to keep the game close, right? You can't allow the game to, you know, separate by more than, I would suggest, more than three or four points. Uh, You know, once it starts to get more than three or four points apart, that's when it's going to be almost impossible to mount that comeback. Because what happens is when I get three or four points apart, now I have to recover that in a run, in a serving run. And, uh, you know, trading, just trading side outs with my opponents, I'm going to lose. If in the current system, trading uh, trading side outs with my opponent doesn't hurt me, right? Because I'm just, you know, 0.0.0 points, everything's status quo, right? But on the new system, it's two and two and two and two and two and two. And then if they're ahead of you, you know, that's going to be the end of the game. So, you know, I, I rally scoring will definitely change. Uh, it, it'll, it'll, comebacks will be a thing of the past, big comebacks. And uh, I mean, or when they happen, they'll be just, you know, I'm just like winning the lottery and um, you know, some of the strategies will change in terms of uh, not strategies, but how we have to approach it from a scoring standpoint and from the game getting away from us. But um, uh, you know, so you'll have to like your focus at the beginning of the game will be as important as at the end of the game. You won't be able to, you know, get into a hole like, you know, sometimes you get into a hole like seven, three or something like that, or seven, two. And then you, you start getting your wheel. That happens to me a lot, you know, where it takes me a minute to get my, you know, get my, uh, get going right and so i'll i'll get down in a game and then i'll be able to to work my way back into it then get you you get the seven five or seven six and now you're in the game right but if you're down seven two in rally scoring to 11 anyway it's going to be very difficult to um 
to overcome that deficit and come back and and uh, and win that game. So, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, rally scoring um, may very well come to our game because of television. Uh, you know, it certainly it allows more predictability on uh, time of of you know the time it'll take to finish a game. Yeah, the scoring will probably be longer, 21 points or something like that. But it'll it'll allow that you know we'll be able to finish a game within this amount of time as opposed to nowadays where you know a game could finish in you know five or six minutes or it could take half an hour and you know and that's one of the beauties of our game but obviously it doesn't lend itself to predictable uh you know uh, outlets that want to be predictable like television so we'll see how it goes i do think that you know even if we go to rally scoring the essence of the game will remain and those are the social aspects the exercise the activity the enjoyment of playing uh, it'll just affect some of the strategy how we play so Anyway, that's my thoughts on rally scoring. Hope you enjoyed the podcast this week. Uh, it's always a pleasure to bring this to you. This is our first episode of the next season or next year, I guess. It's episode number 53. So we've, we've, uh, we had the year in review last week and uh, uh, we are uh, uh, going to continue bringing you this kind of content. Uh, if you like the podcast, please give it a review. It helps us uh, reach other players uh, on whatever platform you're on. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please share it with your friends. If you enjoyed it, they probably will too. Stay well out there, and we'll see you next week.